flying freaking dinosaur. This ride, let me tell you. Universal Studios Japan B&M flying coaster, probably the most intense in the world. I'm telling you guys, I've done Tatsu, I've done Manta. Neither of those come close to the sheer madness that is this roller coaster. There is no doubt in my mind that this is the greatest flying coaster ever built. This is going to be my full in-depth review about this ride. So if you make it out to Osaka, Japan, you'll know what to expect when you decide to book it straight to this ride. Now, I first want to talk about just how amazing it is that this ride exists. Because think about it this way. You have a ride like Tatsu that is so huge. It is a terrain coaster. It has all this stuff working in its favor. Flying Dinosaur, not the case. It's on flat ground. They had a very limited plot of land to work with. They had other rides and buildings that they had to navigate around, but B&M still came out on top with an incredible layout. And that is what is so amazing about this ride. By all logic, Tatsu should be the king of flying coasters. It certainly has the stats in its favor, but both rides I got on Flying Dinosaur, I was over the moon about. And I say both because unfortunately I only got two rides on it. Which you're probably like, oh my gosh, only two? You're crazy. Well, no, it's really just amazing that I got two overall because the line for this thing is insane. Both rides that I got on it, I had to wait over an hour for in single rider line. The regular line was a lot worse. Unfortunately, the disadvantage with going single rider line is you do not get to pick where you sit. I'm just grateful that I got a ride towards the front and towards the back, but I never got the front row or the back row. I got row two and row six. And when there's eight rows, you know, I'll take row six. Close enough. My first ride was in row two and I was like, wow, that was amazing. And then I did it towards the back and I was like, oh my gosh, this ride is literally trying to kill you. There are so many positive G-forces on this roller coaster and that is what makes it ridiculously intense. So what about it specifically? Let's kind of walk through the layout here. First, we have a crazy steep drop. And when you're in the back, that is absolutely nuts. Next, we have this messed up element. What the frick? This thing is is insane. This element is basically a zero G roll, except it inverts you on your back by the end of it. It flips you another half roll so that you end on your back. So now there are just so many positive G forces just slamming into your body as you're up against the ground and then you soar up into an inside raven turn. Think of this as the second half of a pretzel loop. And the craziest part is, after it goes through what is like the second half of a pretzel loop, it goes through then an entire pretzel loop. Those three elements back to back is what makes this ride so insane. It is nonstop madness. If there is a downside to it, on this coaster, you can definitely tell which moments are smoother than others. And there's a pattern to it. You can tell which moments are going to be a bit more rattly. And really, it comes down to where all the positive G-forces are. Anytime there is a ton of positives hitting you, it's going to be rattly. So for instance, the bottom of this inside Raven turn, that moment is rattly. The bottom of the pretzel loop, that moment is too. And so when you combine that vibration, and you can definitely feel it, when you combine that with all the positives you're feeling, it's definitely not the best. In moments where you're just gliding around, it is very smooth. It's only in just a few specific spots. And I can't say that it enhances the ride experience. To me, that's probably the biggest downside with this experience. But luckily, I think it makes up for it in layout. Because I mentioned how it has a pretzel loop in it. But what makes this pretzel loop different than the others is this one is steeper. When you start off at the top, you dive sharply towards the ground. And then it whips you through the bottom into a tunnel. So it's pitch black in there and then you soar straight back up to the sky. It's almost like sensory overload because you don't realize which way is up and which way is down because you're just going through these elements at such a quick pace. One of the most amazing parts of this ride is after that pretzel loop, you get airtime. Yes, you get airtime on a flying coaster. Right when you're passing over the Jurassic Center, the train pops up and then back down towards the ground and you get airtime. It is insane. That was probably the biggest surprise with this roller coaster is I didn't even know airtime on a flying coaster was possible, but somehow flying dinosaur does it. Some other moments I like, that helix 
towards the end of the ride, it goes over the pathways. So as you're going through that, you can look down at all the people. That's pretty awesome. And then that last element is an inline twist into the brakes, and that is sweet. Because already, I was thinking, oh, after the helix, it's over. But it packs in one more inversion. So this is a pretty long ride. I wasn't even anticipating it to feel as long as it actually did. So yeah, this layout is absolutely insane. By far the most intense flying coaster ever. It was a lot to take in. I felt almost physically drained after the ride because I was like so shook walking off that thing at what I had just experienced. Now, I wanna talk about the theming because this was a little underwhelming. Universal's known for fantastic theming throughout all these different areas. Flying Dinosaur has very minimal theming. It feels like theming that you'd see at a Six Flags Park. What it is, is you have the entrance sign, you have a few little designs on some of the walls, and then the station looks like a cage. Which I'm fine with the cage part because it's supposed to give you the feeling that you're entering this dinosaur containment area. And so I get it, I think that works. However, that's it. All of the queue is just one massive cattle pen. There is basically no theming as you're waiting for this ride. And that's unfortunate because I know Universal can do better. My guess is the reason why they didn't include it is because it's like what I said in the beginning, they did not have a ton of space to fit in this ride. That Jurassic Park area of Universal Studios Japan is already very narrow. And so fitting in an entire queue line that can hold a massive wait time and fit in a station, maintenance bays, and an entire layout. And so they said, well, we got to sacrifice something what can we give up and I guess at the end of the day it was theming that got on the chopping block so don't expect a lot of theming going into this roller coaster but I think that's okay really where it just affects you is when you're waiting for it but when you're actually on the ride like you don't care it doesn't matter that there's not theming during it plus when the coaster is whizzing past some of the pre-existing buildings such as Jurassic Park the ride it makes for very cool visuals so again I can look past the theming my biggest problem with this coaster is that it is noticeably shaky during very intense moments of positive g-force that is about the only complaint i have i think everything else about this ride is perfect so for its final score i'm going to give it a 9 out of 10. i think this ride is ridiculous I cannot believe that this ride exists, and I really want now more B&M flying coasters in America, because if B&M can do this, I would love to see what else they could do. But that's going to do it for my review of Flying Dinosaur in Universal Studios Japan. Let me know down in the comments below if you've had the opportunity to experience this ride, if you agree with what I've said, or if this coaster is really high on your bucket list. You can post all that down below, and of course, make sure to stay tuned for more coaster reviews here at Coaster Studios, and I'll see you guys next time.